Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is some piece of modern art. And I would like to welcome you to EC3084 Signals and Systems. Today, I would like to talk about power supplies. So the current coming out of your wall has a voltage form that kind of goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down. It's a sinusoid. Now, most of your modern electronic devices do not want to deal with AC voltage. So what they really want is a DC voltage. So the first step in that process is to go through something called a rectifier. And what this does essentially is that it takes the absolute value of whatever is going in. So what's coming out here looks like jute, 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 jute. And this is usually done with a configuration of four diodes, but we don't really need to know that kind of detail for this class. Now, the next thing we could do here is put some sort of filter. We'll say it has a frequency response J omega, the output of which would ideally look like a straight line, but in practice is going to have some sort of weird little variations. It's going to have some wiggles in there. I haven't drawn these in any way to try to be realistic. I'm just trying to give you the idea here. Let me emphasize the axes that represent a zero voltage. So this value here we want is the actual DC value at the output. For a lot of modern electronic devices like cell phones or anything USB powered, that's five volts, but things like nine volts and 12 volts or something for a laptop, somewhere between 20 and 30 volts is also common or at least used to be common. Nowadays, 19.5 volts for a laptop seems to be prevalent. Now, in practice, there's usually a transformer that goes in front here that takes the actual voltage coming out of the wall and steps it down to some sort of voltage that's more appropriate for what's coming later, but we're not going to worry about that here. So let's call this rectified signal X of T, and we'll call the signal coming out of the filter Y of T. So in designing this filter, it would be good to have some kind of figure of merit. And the figure of merit that people usually choose is called ripple. And basically, this is the root mean square of the harmonics divided by the DC value. Now, in the US and some other countries, the wall current has a 60 hertz cycle. Some other countries use 50 hertz. But remember that after we rectify it, the actual period is half the original period. So the signal here is 120 hertz in terms of its fundamental frequency. So we could also say that omega naught is equal to 2 pi times that. So I could write 240 pi radians per second. And also I could say T naught is equal to 1 over 120 seconds in terms of what the period is. So what's the root mean square value of the harmonics? Well, the root mean square value of any signal is the average of the square of that signal over any period normalized by the period. So I have one over T naught. I'm going to write a little T naught down here to indicate that we can integrate over any period. And the sort of math that we're talking about here also works for complex numbers. So I'm going to put a magnitude sign here, although since all of our time functions here are real, I could just put regular parentheses here if I wanted. But anyway, what am I going to put inside the magnitude bars? Well, basically, I'm going to write the Fourier series representation of the signal, but I want to leave out the DC value. So I'll write for k not equal to zero, it's a sum from k going from minus infinity to infinity, except we leave out the DC component. So I'll write a k e to the j omega naught. What's omega naught? It's 240 pi times k t. And we want the magnitude squared because this is a mean square. So the s here indicates square, and that's this square right here, magnitude square. The m indicates the mean. And that's associated with taking the integral here and dividing by the period. And then r means root. So I want to put a big square root over here. Now, what is all of the stuff in here really? 
Well, this is the function minus the DC value. So essentially what this is here is that it's x of t minus a naught. So the way I've written it here, this is the ripple you would get if you didn't have any filtering at all. So let's first see how bad that is, and then we can see what happens when we put in the filter. We need to know what the Fourier series coefficients of x of t are. Going through a couple of pages of calculus and algebra reveals that a of k is equal to 1 over pi times 1 minus 4k squared, with the 1 minus 4k squared in parentheses. That's a fairly standard Fourier series that you could look up. So we have a naught a1 equal minus 2 over 3 pi, a2 equal minus 2 over 15 pi, and a3 equal minus 2 over 35 pi. So this does slope off pretty quickly. So pumping this into a calculator will give you 0 0.6366 minus 0 0.2122 minus 0 0.0424 and minus 0 0.0182. So that's just a bunch of numbers. Oh, and it looks like I also forgot the DT here. Sorry about that. Anyway, computing this integral directly in the time domain using the standard techniques of calculus would be extraordinarily painful. Luckily, we can use Parseval's theorem which will tell us that this whole mess here is equal to the square root of the stuff computed using Parseval's theorem. Basically, all I need to do is square and then add up the Fourier series coefficients. Of course, I need to make sure I'm only taking these non-zero coefficients. So I would wind up with a1 squared, which is 0 0.2122 squared, I'll explain why I have this bracket here in a little bit. So then I'll have minus 0 0.0424 squared. I know this isn't very exciting. And then I'll have minus 0 0.0182 squared. Now, of course, there's a bunch of other terms out here, but for the purposes of what we're doing here, I'm going to approximate it using just these first three terms. Now, what about that bracket that I put there? Well, this actually isn't all of the coefficients. It's only the positive coefficients. Fortunately, the squared magnitudes of the negative coefficients, a minus 1, a minus 2, and a minus 3, are the same as the square magnitudes of a1, a2, and a3, since the underlying signal is real. So I'm just going to put a 2 here in front so I can count each of those terms twice. Now, adding all of that up, gives me a square root of 0 0.0944, which is 0 0.3072. So that's our RMS. So the resulting ripple would be 0 0.3072 over the DC value, which is 0 0.6366. And well, that corresponds to a 48% ripple. That is not great. That is a whole lot of ripple. But again, that's what we get here just from x of t. That's assuming we're not doing any filtering. So let's see how the situation improves when we include a real filter. So we need to pick an actual filter. And I'm going to use a very simple one-pole low-pass filter in our usual canonical form of omega c over s plus omega c for our cutoff. And omega c is going to be equal to 1 over rc because we're going to use a fairly bog standard one pole filter. So we have an input coming in here, we're tapping an output here, and I have my r and my c. Now, in the example we're about to do, we need to pick some values for r and c. So, how about for c, let's pick 1 microfarad, and for r, let's pick 10 kilo ohm. These two together will give me an omega c of 100 radians per second. So that's where our half power cutoff is. So let's call the Fourier series coefficients of 
the signal Y, the output of the filter BK. So those are going to be AK times the filter evaluated at the frequency going in, which is going to be 240 pi, that's omega naught, times K. And when you think about it, we really only need the magnitudes for the kind of work that we're doing here. So what we want now is to compute this same kind of form, except with BK instead of AK, because this whole thing here really corresponds to the output signal Y of T minus its DC value, which is now determined by B0. So I can leave the various A values here because those are going to be handy. I'm going to get rid of the minus signs though because of course I wind up taking the magnitude squared of everything anyway. So let me squoosh these over and let's stick some parentheses here. All right, so my magnitude of B0, magnitude of B1, magnitude of B2, and magnitude of B3 are going to be equal to the magnitude of a0, a1, a2, and a3 times this function evaluated at s equal j omega, where omega is this 240 pi times k. So that's h of j0 magnitude, magnitude of big h j 240 pi, magnitude of big h j 480 pi, and magnitude of big h j 720 pi. All right, so if we actually compute these values and plug them in, if you shove all of that mess into your calculator, well, of course, for this guy here, that's just one at DC. So that's not actually terribly interesting. At this 240 pi radians per second, we wind up with a magnitude of 0 0.1315. Of course, this filter will give us various phases, but that's not important here. For the second harmonic, we wind up multiplying by 0 0.0662. And for the third harmonic, we wind up multiplying by 0 0.0442. And this all equals a bunch of stuff. Let me go ahead and put the stuff over here. So the RMS value winds up being square root of two times a bunch of stuff. And that stuff the 0.2122 times 0.1315 gives us 0 0.0279, and I need to square that. B2 winds up being 0 0.0028, or I should say the magnitude of B2, and I wind up squaring that. And then my third term here, I'll take 0 0.008, and wind up squaring that. Oops, actually there's another zero in here. Don't forget that. And again, I need to multiply by two to deal with the B minus one, B minus two, and B minus three terms, which have the same magnitude as B1, B2, and B3. And this all winds up giving us a number of 0 0.0412. So in this case, my ripple winds up being 0 0.0412 over my DC value, which is still 0 0.6366. So that winds up being 6.5%, which is much better than the 48% that we had without any filtering at all.